We're all set. Okay, uh, good afternoon. We will call to order the East, uh, May 28th meeting of the East Lansing Downtown Development Authority. Uh, if Chad would take the roll call, please. Thank you, Chair. Ball line. Mayor Byer. Here. Clayton. Here. Kroom. Sorry about the background. Dewan. Present. Hackney. Present. Kruger. Mayor Byer. Here. Kruger. Oh, he's muted. <laughs> You're muted, Mike. <laughs> okay. Lahanas. George, you're muted. Okay. Rody. Here. And Smith. Here. Thank you. We have a quorum. Uh, I offer a motion to approve the agenda as presented by staff. Um, uh, Luke Hackney, I'll, I'll make that, uh, I'll uh, second that. Seconded by Luke. Uh, all those in favor of the agenda say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Lindsay, you had your hand up? No, I was just affirming that I vote yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, the agenda has been approved. Uh, we have the minutes in our packet from our previous May 14th meeting. Are there any changes to the minutes? Hearing none, uh, uh, make a motion to approve the minutes as presented. I'll support. Seconded by Luke Hackney. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, passes unanimously. We'll move on to our financial reports. Heather? Uh, yeah. Um, uh, Chair Dewan, do you want to um, state the two-minute reminder of the two-minute um, time limit? Oh, okay. I'm sorry. That's okay. I, yeah, at our previous meeting, we approved a motion to uh, public comment for two minutes for all electronic meetings of the DDA, so we don't have to go through that exercise every meeting that was approved at our last meeting. So. I just wanted to let the public be aware when we get to the public comment section of our meeting, they'll have an opportunity to address any and all items that they wish to address uh, with the DDA. But we will, as a matter of courtesy, limit it to two minutes for each participant. Um, so I don't think I need to address any other there. Heather? Yep. Right. Okay. Can everybody see the screen okay? Yep. Okay. Well, it's um, tiny, but yes. Okay. I can try to make it a little bigger. Is that better? better? Okay. Better. Can you guys um, hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yep. Can oh, you hear us? Okay. So I'm going to focus on our current month transactions. This would be for April. Um, nothing really out of the normal. Um, we have our rental lease um, income that we receive from waste management for the refuse rooms. Um, going on down <clears throat> for our current um, expenses, we have our normal direct charges, um, both for salary and wages and benefits. Um, we had a $105 bill for our legal services. Communications telephone for 108. This is for our cameras and keep out system in the 300 block refuse room. Um, under our project development um, fund, we spent $1,029. 1,000 of that amount is for the sponsorship. It was um, year three of five of the B, um, B2 art, labs, art Lab sponsorship. So that was paid out this month. And the $29 is for our um, email service um, for the city of East Lansing. Um, we had some um, ma minor repairs and maintenance that took place and our computer rental um, monthly charge. And there's also our monthly um, 
con contribution to the debt service fund and our contribution to the parking fund. And those are always the same amount each month. Those are a monthly transfer. Moving on down, um, we had our insurance bonds and claims. Again, that's uh, once a month, we have that amount transferred out. And then we did um, in April make our principal payment um, for the Evergreen properties of $110,000. And then our interest expense was 102,681. So that's the total amount that we paid out this fiscal year for these two line items. So our year to date for principal payment is 110 and our interest expense um, for this year is $221,824.89. Um, you will note in our interest expense, we did have it budgeted at $282,170. Any questions? Thank you, Heather. Uh, mm -hmm. Seeing no questions, we will move on to written communications on our agenda. Um, Luke was kind enough to share this article that appeared in the Lansing State Journal uh, with regard to food delivery. And um, it is uh, offered, I, I think it would make sense with the DDA's support to just refer this to our public policy and market development committee to discuss um, and get the expertise of the members of that committee. I don't know if anyone had any other ideas and I can't see anyone at the moment, Heather. Um, oh, I'll stop sharing. I'm sorry. <laughs> there you go. That's okay. <laughs> is uh, is there any opinion or thought about having the that subcommittee take a look at this and see if there's anything that we can do possibly? Uh, look, actually, I'll, I'll interject just because I brought it up, but. But that's completely agreeable to me, Peter. I just think it's the more I read about the subject, the more I think that I should we should at least be talking about it. I mean, some of the, some of these businesses are getting some of the transactions are up to like you know fifty to sixty to seventy percent of the bill is getting taken away from the restaurant and to third party applications. And and I just in a time like this where people are relying a hundred percent on on things like this, I, I think we need to look at it. So I'm. I'm Absolutely okay with that idea, and th thank you for doing that. Yeah, great. Um, Michael, did you want to weigh in on this at all, or? Oh, he's muted. No. You. We couldn't hear you there, Michael. Yeah, I think you're having issues, buddy. <laughs> well. Um, Unfortunately, we can't hear you, but I do think it makes sense for us to have a further conversation. So Luke, thank you for uh, sharing the article and we'll refer that to the uh, Public Policy and Market Development Committee to review. Uh, Lindsay, you had a comment? Yeah, Mike, if you have something to add, could you possibly text it and someone could, vo it could say what you wanna say? You can text on Zoom or is that too much? Okay. Sorry, I just really wanted to make sure that he has, if he has something to say, he can say it. I think he's trying to log back in. Okay. We can always circle back at the end. Yep. Yep. Why don't we, yeah, why don't we do that? And nonetheless, Luke, thank you for sharing that. We'll, we'll circle back. Hopefully Michael will be able to uh, share his comments. Um, are there any uh, communications from staff at the moment? <clears throat> Yes, just real briefly, I wanted to give the, the board a couple updates. Um, so in terms of uh, MSU, FCU and their project, um, they're working diligently uh, towards an application, um, probably a, still a few weeks out on, on their formal application, uh, which obviously will be brought to the DDA for consideration at that point. Uh, they are nearly complete with their due diligence um, in terms of the property. They did find some contamination in the ground um, staff is working to assist them in potentially applying for an EGLE grant. Uh, and beyond that, they're researching whether it makes sense or not for them to pursue a brownfield plan. Uh, if they do make a formal request for a plan, we will certainly uh, spin up the, the BRA and bring that forward for consideration. 
Um, in terms of River Caddis, um, they've also been working uh, diligently, uh, having a lot of meetings with stakeholders and staff. Um, and we are working on setting up a first meeting of the project team uh, for probably the mid-June kind of time frame. And then Heather, if uh, you wouldn't mind giving an update on the sidewalk project. Yes. So the sidewalk Real quick, can you guys hear me? Yes. 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 Yeah. Okay. Oh, we can hear you. Right. Yep. So yeah, uh, sidewalk project along Grand River, 100, 200 blocks started on May 18th. Um, they completed the east end from MAC up to where the new sidewalk started in front of Target. The area um, and it reopened this past Tuesday. Um, now they're working on some of the brick pavers and that that will be reinstalled around the tree um, where they removed the tree grates and that and along the curb line. They now moved to the west end. Um, and so they're working from um, basically urban outfitters down to Abbott Road. Um, and that project, that area will take a little longer because um, as we're working in that area, there is another project going on with the urban outfitters building itself. Um, and they're gonna be doing some waterproofing in that area. And then our contractor will come in and put over the um, traffic coating um, that was uh, that's, um, being installed in that area. So. That project will probably last um, a little bit longer, about two weeks, because there is a drying process for the um, for the waterproofing. So, but everything's moving along fine with that project. Okay, thank you, Tom and Heather. Uh, before we move on to public comment, now that we can hear Michael, I just want to go back to you. Um, we referred the item that uh, with regard to Grubhub to the. Um, Project and Market Development Committee subcommittee, and, and if you had some additional comments you'd like to add, they're certainly welcome. Ah, thank you. Um, I don't really have anything additional. I think I was probably quoted in that article. Um, I can't seem to bring it up on my thing, but yeah, it's uh, um, no. I think going to P and I will be fine, and then we can talk about it more there. So. Sounds great. Thank you. All right, we will. Thank you. Thank you. We will move on to. Uh, public comment section of our meeting. Uh, again, the public is welcome to address any and all items that is on our agenda or not on our agenda. Um, we will select the callers uh, in the chronological order in the queue. And um, callers, uh, please know that you have two minutes to make your comments. So with that, I will turn it over to Nicole. Are there any callers wishing to address the DDA? Yep, it's Jake Parcell. Um, we have one attendee. Uh, the phone number or the last digit is 963. I am allowing to talk now and you have two minutes starting now. The floor is yours. Thanks, Jake. This is Alice Strager, 621 Sunset Lane. I just had two questions related to what's going on um, with development. One is whether or not the city is planning to use TIF on the MSU FCU building for public infrastructure. And the second is whether or not the DDA is going to pursue prior conversations with regard to obtaining external counsel with special specialization for development deals, because that was talked about before. And the exclusive on River Caddis comes up again in July. So it's coming up again pretty soon, whether that gets extended or um, canceled or whether there's a development agreement that comes out of that. It seems important if you're going to have external counsel with specialty expertise to have that in line soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any additional items or callers that wish to address the DDA? Nope, there's only one attendee. Okay, thank you. Um, well, as a follow-up to the, some of those questions, um, you know, the, the, the full DDA will have conversations. Uh, as Tom had indicated, we're scheduling a meeting. It's a matter of trying to accommodate everyone's calendar with regard, regard to the project review team. Um, so uh, many of the items that uh, Ms. Drager has addressed will be forthcoming uh, as, as meetings are established and conversations are held. So um, we will move on to our business agenda. Uh, item 6-1, the concessionaire program guideline. Uh, and is that Heather? 
Yes, it is me. Thank you, Heather. So at the March 11, 2020 Public Policy Market Development Committee meeting, um, the committee um, put together some changes to the guidelines um, and they're here for the board's review. Um, if the board does want to move forward with these changes, a recommendation would go to city council um, and city council would they, um, approve them. So can everybody see the screen okay? Okay. Yes. So really there's basically two, two changes. The first is that there originally had been an advisory committee um, established that would review the concessionaire applications. Um, and then those applications would be forwarded to the um, full DDA for, um, for action. And um, the committee, um, the public policy committee is recommending that the concessionaire applications when they come in they actually don't go through a committee, they go directly to um, the full B, um, DDA board um, for review and recommendation. And so that would um, change item one. And then going through the document on the next page, um, again, there's some just changes where we're removing advisory committee um, and just putting in DDA in its place. So that's the first change. And then moving down, if you'll recall when this, um, po this um, policy was put in place, there was a pilot program that was established that would allow businesses, um, food trucks or concessionaires to come in for a two week um, period um, with a, for a hundred dollar um, fee um, to, to basically test the market to see if this was something they wanted to do. And so now that pilot program has expired, it expired in uh, last year in 2019. Um, since we we're making these other changes, we felt it was appropriate time to remove that even though it does um, state that sunsets in that clause or in this policy, we felt if we were doing those other changes, we should remove these also. So um, I'll give it back to the public policy committee members and see if any of them want to add anything else to this. So, uh, go ahead, Lindsay. So there was one thing I cut, cut off during the public policy meeting um, section or the, during the part of the meeting where we discussed this. And I would really like the city in, to, as a whole, not just the DDA, to explore allowing ice cream trucks. And um, so I, I don't know if that needs to go into this. I think it probably should, but, and I know we've had a lot of discussions regarding this specific um, rule within our city. And there are a lot of very strong opinions about it, but I would like us to at least consider somehow including ice cream trucks. Thank you, Lindsay. Uh, I have a question for any member of the Public Policy and Market Development Committee. Uh, if you could just go to item, it's really just the indemnity and insurance provision section uh, of, the, um, of the guidelines. And we're requesting that the participants have a 300,000 limit with regard to liability coverage, which I find to be inadequately low. And I'm wondering if anyone talked about that during the subcommittee meeting or if there were any concerns and, and particularly for the fact that, you know, these participants will have to name the city as an additional insured uh, and indemnify the city, but if we have one food truck that's serving during a busy festival uh, weekend or, or there's a, a large gathering of people in the downtown, that $300,000 is not gonna go too far if there's a bad batch of chili that 100 or 200 or 300 people uh, consume. So uh, to me, a standard limit should be a million dollar per occurrence, but I open that up for the discussion of the board So I can sort of address it. We, we did not talk about this mic. Sorry, I chair that committee, but we did not talk about that specifically. Um, although I don't see why that would be an issue. I don't, I know the cost for insurance. Um, I mean, I, obviously I deal with it here at Crunchies, but it's, it can't be a whole lot more for the million dollar coverage versus the 300,000 um, per occurrence. So I guess I'm yeah. indifferent, but. I would just You're the offer, insurance guy. 
Well, I would just offer a friendly amendment or change to instead of it being at 300,000 per occurrence to make it a million, which is relatively standard. Um, and if if the committee is or the board is um, agreeable to that, then I would request a second. I second. It's been seconded by Lindsay. Um, mm -hmm. No, I think that was Mayor Byer. Oh, okay, Mayor Byer. I again, uh, Heather. I can only see one person on the screen. If you can, there we go. There you go. Thank you. Uh, so it was seconded by Mayor Byer. Yes. Okay. Any further conversation? Uh, go ahead, Lindsay. So you said that a million dollars is pretty standard in the in the restaurant business. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to make sure that you know we go with whatever is consistent. Yeah, it, it sounds like a lot, but when you really get back, like like Mike said, the difference between three might be a couple hundred bucks. Yeah. So, it, in the interest of uh, protecting the city, I think it's advisable to increase that limit. So, uh, it's been seconded by the mayor. Um, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Uh, seeing none, that will make that friendly amendment uh, to the uh, insurance limit. Is there any further discussion about the this policy resolution? Uh, Jill? Hi. Just, can we talk about the timing of this? We really want to look like we're encouraging more food vendors downtown when the ones are struggling so much. That's just my opinion. Uh, Luke? Um. Yeah, I get, I get what you're saying, but also um, all these will be up for, for review individually and this board actually has a tendency to never allow them ever. So I don't know if- Exactly. It, right, so it probably doesn't matter. <laughs> Let them try. And maybe if someone does apply, Heather, you can tell them that. Uh, Lindsay, go ahead. Is there, would anyone else, well, I guess I'd have to put a motion, but I don't know how I'd word it. Um, but I would, is anyone else interested in seeing food truck or in seeing ice cream trucks in our community or do we prefer personally my kids hear them going down the street on the other side of the road which is Meridian Township and all the kids get super excited but then they have to be reminded that East Lansing doesn't allow ice cream trucks and I don't know. I just feel like this is the perfect time in our community to be embracing things like ice cream trucks, but maybe we all want everyone going into a ice cream parlor and sitting there and having ice cream. But I, I don't know. I, I think that we need to be a little bit more diverse in the things that we allow here. Uh, Michael. Is, is there some sort of history as to why ice cream trucks are not allowed? I guess. I'm not familiar yeah. with that. Yes. Is that, is that separate from like this um, policy resolution here? I mean, I, to, in my view, I don't think it's separate. I, what we're talking about are people functioning uh, as concessionaires in the downtown development district. So what food they're preparing, whether it's ice cream or otherwise is to me, somewhat immaterial. It's a matter of, can they be concessionaires? Right. right. So, so to be clear for Lindsay, are you asking them to be allowed in the DDA district or in the neighborhood? Ideally, so this is where I think it doesn't necessarily fit into the concessionaires because the concessionaires has specific spots where you are designated right. that you can set up. And I think that if uh, that uh, ice cream truck or like a Kona ice truck is unique and um, they drive around and sell their items. And I know that at least for my neighborhood, it has been very, for years, they did not want something like that because there was a, a stigma about ice cream trucks. Um, but I, I don't know. I just think that it doesn't really fit into this, but it kind of does, and that we should be having this discussion about these types of things. But maybe that's for public policy in another time, but I just wanted to bring it up because I think that we are in the middle of ice cream season and kids would love if they could just get a popsicle from an ice cream truck. 
it shouldn't be that complicated, but that's my opinion. Okay, so let's deal with the resolution that's in front of us. Are there any additional comments or ideas? Uh, I'm, I'm comfortable with the changes that have been made. I like the fact that it's gonna be coming before the full DDA as opposed to a subcommittee. That seems to make sense. Uh, I'm willing to offer a motion to approve the resolution as <coughs> and amend it and present it um, and ask for a second. Oh, Luke Hackney. Uh, uh, it's been seconded by Luke. Any further conversation about the resolution? Uh, seeing none, we'll go ahead and vote. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Is there anyone opposed? Seeing none, that passes unanimously. Thank you for your comments and perhaps, uh, Lindsay, the idea about the ice cream trust can be addressed uh, in a separate conversation, either in subcommittee or pass on those ideas to the council. Um, we hey, have Greg, just a Greg here. Point of clarification. Uh, and is that Tom? I, I just had a I point don't... of clarification. Yeah, go ahead. Tom. Yes, this is Tom Fernbach. Just a point of clarification that your motion was to recommend the, that the council approve this. Yes. This, um, this resolution. Okay, thank you. Yes. Um, we'll move on to item seven one, and I know you were you were pulling that up on the screen, Heather. Yeah. Okay. And this is with regard to our conversations about expanded outdoors uh, dining options. Correct. Correct. Uh, is, this, is this you, Tom? So uh, I, I think Heather can kick it off. <laughs> okay. Kick it off. Thank so, you. Um, let's see what's up here. so, Tuesday evening, City Council um, did review Ordinance 1486. 1486 would designate. Uh, three open air dining areas um, within those. Those areas are um, daily parking lot, lot 11. Um, the north area of the parking. Um, I'm going to mute somebody. I'm going to mute director. <laughs> um, the Valley Court um, area, the, the parking spaces on the north side of Valley Court parking, of uh, Valley Court Park, and um, and then the, the main um, location is Albert Avenue, um, just um, between the city center parking garage, um, center city parking garage under an exits and um, MAC. Um, so city council did review this. They've set a public hearing for this for uh, June 9th. Um, the, the hours of um, operation or the hours that these areas would be available would be 11 a.m. to 10 p.m. Um, with um, the dates beginning June 1st um, through August 15th, that these locations would be um, available. Go ahead. Um, following our work, our meeting last month. Heather, you just said 10 p.m., but the letter says 11 p.m.? Yes, that was a typo in my, in my memo. It is 10 p.m.? Yes, it's outside p.m. outside my bedroom window. I have a yep. interest. <laughs> you have yeah. a vested interest. <laughs> yeah, so it's, you're, it's going to be 10 p.m. I think that's great. Yes, yes. So um, here is what we're proposing um, for Albert Avenue. Um, it would be a total of 16 picnic tables spaced out. Um, there would be uh, barriers um, at either end and along the, um, along the um, north, right here on the basically dividing the, um, the street. But the entire street would be closed. Um, we um, have we left room over here um, so that people can still access the alley. So this would be for delivery vehicles um, for the businesses over in this area. Let's see here, can everybody see that? Okay, it's a little small. Let's see if I can zoom in a little bit better. Heather, I, I have a question about. Um, the number of tables specifically. And I understand that there's certain spacing requirements and, and you've um, you know, put them together uh, in an effort to try and remain um, safe distances, social distancing. But I, I'm just curious, 
16 doesn't seem to me to be a lot of tables for that entire area. And if the tables, instead of going horizontally, went vertically, would you be able to get more tables into that area? I, you know, instead of 16, perhaps 20. Okay. I can check on that. And it, because yeah. it does seem like there's quite a bit of space. And then I guess the question becomes, um, are, are tables allowable on the sidewalk or what are, what are, is the city staff opinion on that? So this is Tom here. Um, so uh, essentially what this is, is kind of phase one um, of what we can do quickly uh, to allow uh, the use of, of Albert Avenue as an expansion of where people can sit and eat and eat. And this ordinance would also allow for <laughs> folks to uh, purchase packaged liquor um, and then be able to um, uncap that and drink it within, within this uh, area as well. I think in, in phase two, what we're looking at is a little bit more complicated, um, which is why uh, it won't be able to be done as quickly. But that's where we would look to expand um, kind of the outdoor dining uh, for individual restaurants. And what, what we're looking at right now is uh, whether we can kind of take some sort of a blanket action that would allow for restaurants to kind of expand into the sidewalk. Um, and, and kind of expand the areas that's kind of under their purview. Um, and so we feel that this sort of would dovetail nicely into, into this um, kind of plan that we have here. And ultimately kind of the sidewalk would be kind of part of the, the second phase of this. Phase one really is for folks to be able to uh, purchase takeout um, and potentially packaged liquor. Phase two really bore the expansion of, of the outdoor dining onto the sidewalks. Uh, and again, this is in, in phase one, this is our, our kind of pilot area. Um, the, the ordinance anticipates two additional areas, Bailey lot 11 uh, and an area on Valley Court Park is some of the parking spaces along, along the, the road there uh, where we would be able to kind of launch this, uh, hopefully work out the, the kinks and then move quickly into those, those other two areas as well. So hopefully that makes sense and addresses that question. Hey, Tom, could I jump in quick? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm... Go ahead, George. You're muted, George. Okay, I'm having like double sound. Uh, can you guys hear me clearly or am I hearing coming across the neck? We can hear you now. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so one thing we can have Scott look at, Scott House, he did the plan drawings to see if the if the table's going sideways does fit more with social distancing, right? We can still use the one lane and maybe see if that's a better plan. So that's something we can look at, I think. The other thing is I'd like to try to include Ann Street Plaza. If we wanted to include that, do we have to make a change now? Or is that something we can just include? Uh, that's a question for Tom Yaden, I guess. Do we just have to block that area and close it to traffic? George, Ann Street Plaza is in the ordinance currently, is it not? Uh, we talked about that, Tom, and, and uh, it didn't need to be spelled out specifically because technically oh, it's okay. part of the roadway. So yeah. yes, it is, it is anticipated as part of you know, what's allowable under this ordinance. Uh, I think that um, it just didn't end up on the map because it will be a separate enclosed area um, to allow for that alley access. So I'd be hoping we could put four or five, six tables more on Ann Street Plaza as well, which I think would be a great yeah. area. Oh yeah. So uh, Tom uh, Fehrenbach, you indicated that there would be a phase two. What, what's the timetable on, I presume that council is taking action on ex allowing this at their next council meeting, is that correct? The, the this ordinance is uh, is queued up for consideration by the council on June 9th, which is the next council meeting. Uh, we are working as quickly as possible uh, to research all the various elements necessary uh, to allow for uh, individual SUPs to be um, to be modified. And we're looking for kind of a, a mechanism to uh, to streamline that as quickly as possible. Um, that will be necessary for 
uh, restaurants that want to take advantage of the uh, liquor controls relaxed rules will need the approval from the city prior to being able to be approved by the MLCC. Uh, their, their allowance um, currently at, would, would allow outdoor dining uh, expanded to continue until the end of October. Um, but as far as the time frame, I think the, the best I can tell you at the moment is as soon as possible. So if the DDA, I, I'm sorry, I'll get to you guys in just a second, uh, Lindsay and then okay. Michael. Let's do Mike first. Well, just as a follow-up to my question, uh, Tom, as far as an action item for the DDA today, we're re making recommendations to the council as far as dining options. We're not necessarily recommending a seating plan. Is that correct? That's correct. Uh, we certainly are open to your um, feedback regarding the seating, but I think the main thrust of what we're looking for uh, is the DDA's consideration of this particular ordinance related to the outdoor dining uh, open air areas uh, and any particular feedback that you have regarding this ordinance that we can bring to council on June 9th. Okay, thank you. So let's go to Lindsay and then Michael. No, can you let Michael go first, please? Go ahead, Michael. Okay, okay. Um, I just have a, um, a concern or question, I guess, about liability issues. Um, namely, who who does the liability fall on out there and in street plaza and along the road once, um, you know, a, a restaurant is to sell some of their packaged liquor to go, um, who's taking care of all of that out there? Who does that fall on? Tom Yaden, can you speak to that? Sure. Um, the uh, liquor store is still responsible for not uh, selling liquor to an intoxicated person. So whatever restaurant is, is selling their packaged liquor has the responsibility not to uh, sell it to anyone intoxicated. That's always the rule. Um, the, sure. uh, there's no additional liability for any of the restaurants uh, other than that. Their, you know, their obligation, once the person exits their restaurant, they don't have any additional liability for, for themselves because okay. people are consuming it near their restaurant. Uh, the city so, doesn't really have any liability either any more than it would have if, you know, if people drink beer in Patriarch Park. So there's no added liability to the city or the DDA for permitting this either. The, you know, there, there's no like gram shop laws or anything that, that require the city to do any extra monitoring for people who are consuming alcohol in like city parks. And I just think of this as a, an added type of city park where alcohol is allowed. So, to, so just, just so that I'm clear and so that I can go back to the, the RHC and to all of the members who contacted me about this, um, if, uh, and I'll just use my restaurant as an example, even though we're not located in that area, but if I'm to sell a, a customer, you know, four or five crawlers of beer, you know, to go along with their four or five burgers that they ordered, um, and they are then to take that to a designated area to drink, um, you know, I don't have any liability if they're to feed those crawlers to uh, somebody underage, uh, to um, somebody who is intoxicated already, um, et cetera. Um, but I'm absolved of all of that at this point. Yeah, from, from my perspective, you would be, I mean, you might want to consult your own attorneys to, to make sure of that, but I don't see any, there's no additional liability for you because it'd be the same as if they went to their house and served someone right. intoxicated, same if they went to a city park and served someone intoxicated. You don't, once they leave your premises with that liquor, you don't have any responsibility for that liquor if they take it anywhere in the city. I mean, so it's the same thing. Okay. You don't have... Uh, any additional responsibility. Okay, and then uh, I guess just to follow up with that, um, 
does the city plan on, you know, sort of uh, having officers in these designated areas in case um, there were to be uh, situations wherein patrons are becoming overly intoxicated or, um, you know, uh, causing fights or problems or, you know, that sort of thing. Um, you know, I don't want, I don't want something that's, you know, got a crunchies label on it because that's how we label our crawlers, for example, uh, to come back, you know, um, at us because somebody got a fight down there and did something stupid. Yeah. No, uh, I, I suspect, I mean, that's probably a better question for the city manager of how well this is going to be policed, but I suspect there'll be, you know, a police presence around there's, you know, they're sure. only a block away. Um, the, uh, you know, there, there is a two hour limit so that, um, it, you know, that's obviously going to be hard to enforce if people are staying there for two and a half hours. But if you see a group of individuals who's been there, you know, all afternoon, you can enforce the two hour limit and, you know, tell them it's time to move on. So there are mechanisms in place to try to stop what you're concerned about is a, you know, drunken gathering. So, right. Yeah. So okay. I can just quickly say we've and talked then, to the, can, can you hear me? Or? Yeah. Go, uh, yeah go ahead, so I've talked to the chief about this and obviously, you know, part of the concern with doing this is, is a, this is a pretty big change for us. And obviously we think it's an important one to support the restaurants in the downtown, but we've talked about having regular patrols through the downtown. The police presence can't be continuous during you know, 11 a.m. to 10 p.m. all day long patrolling because that's just impractical with how many officers we have. But the chief has anticipated through June and July to have heavier presence down there to make sure they're keeping an eye on things. And that's already been taken into account in terms of their staffing for the summer. So this is expected. I would expect a heavier presence, but not a continual presence. And if it's a problem, if, that if it does become a big problem, We've got to do something to fix it. We can't, we wouldn't allow it to continue. And that's why we have the right to actually take this down and take it apart without even going back to council. So if, if it turns into a drunken revelry, we're, we're just absolutely not going to allow that to continue because that's very bad for downtown. So, but our goal is to have it safe, to have it to get patrons to buy their alcohol and food and enjoy it and leave. Go ahead, Michael. Just one, yeah, one more point of clarification. Um, is this the intent of this uh, ordinance to begin um, immediately or with the, uh, you know, um, semi opening of dining rooms as should be expected within the next couple of weeks? You know, so we expected obviously June 1, we had thought to have the tables out and then we'd have to wait for council's action if they decide to go that direction June 9. So alcohol potentially coming June 10. But obviously with the stay home order delayed, we would expect that it would be June 13. If, if uh, so council would have taken their action, we would know that already. And then if the governor takes her action to allow a loosening of, of gatherings, we could do that all by June 13 is what we're guessing. Does that sound right, Tom Fehrenbach? Yes. Okay, right. and then also as far as, as, far as the governor's orders uh, in the coming weeks, I know that there's also some talk of um, actually allowing the, the sale of uh, you know, mixed cocktails um, for businesses with SBM licenses. If that were to go into effect, would that be allowed under this ordinance or are we still going to be sticking to strictly packaged beer and wine? Got to ask Mr. Gaden that question uh, for his expertise on that. I think I think if it's allowed under the state, we would allow it under our ordinance, but Mr. Gaden? Okay. Yeah, the, the uh, ordinance just permits open alcohol and consumption of alcohol, so it doesn't define... Okay. It has mixed drinks or anything like that. So anything the state allows would be allowed in this area under our current ordinance. Cool. All right. Thanks, guys. Okay. Uh, go ahead, Lindsay. Okay. So I have two questions um, right now. Why the August 15 deadline? Especially if someone was talking about something within the October with, is that from the Michigan Liquor Control? I mean, I realize the student coming back and whatnot um but also and why the 11 a.m start because i would think we've got some businesses that serve breakfast or are like coffee shops and i would also like to explore possibly looking into us helping purchase some two top tables 
so that we don't get coffee shop patrons taking up 16 tables with one person in each one of them. So those are just a few different things. So we picked the 11, 11 a.m. start just to be able to get the lunch crowd, seeming that that was a good time to catch the lunch crowd. If we're gonna figure out how to sanitize tables and do that whole process from 7 a.m. or 8 a.m. till 10 p.m. seemed like a long stretch with very little usage. If you think about the downtown at 9 a.m., 10 a.m., 8 a.m., but we're open to it. We just have to figure out how to sanitize tables, have people down there. Is that gonna be useful? Are we going to get a lot of bang for the buck at, at 9 a.m. as opposed to noon, 5, 6, 7, 8? That's the thought. But Tom Fehrenbach, did you have a view on that? No, I think I share that view. Um, and in terms of the, um, the other question, um, I think that the idea was, you know, when we have a lot more uh, folks in town, um, reopening Albert might be, might make a sense from a, um, kind of transportation aspect. Um, and, and also, I think, you know, the, the main purpose of, of this would, would really be to try, try to focus the energies on, um, you know, getting, getting folks um, in, in the local neighborhood and, and such to, to come support downtown businesses during the summer. Um, the expanded uh, footprint for individual restaurants that we're working on is phase two that can potentially last under the MLCC's rules until um, until the end of October, I understand. Um, and so that that is it could be mutually exclusive from from this outdoor dining area and last longer. And the other thing about if the students I could just... is, I'm I'm also cautious about making a recommendation when students are here, just because we have thirty thousand additional residents. I mean, it's a huge concentration of people, so that would be a recommendation we would have to be very cautious about. Um, this is a this is a big step in terms of a different approach to alcohol in the downtown, and I think the the time justifies that. But to think about that beyond August 15, I think is a different question, and certainly one council would want to consider before making that judgment. And if I could just add something, George, sure. Lindsay, the the uh, 11 o'clock time is really the time that you can start consuming alcohol. So um, that's why we need an ordinance of this nature is to permit the alcohol to be consumed in the area. So I don't know if there's a big demand for alcohol prior to uh, 11 a.m., but we didn't see it. So that's why the focus was on, on that as the starting time. The tables so, could ahead. be there. Any, I mean, City manager determines if the tables are there in the morning, whether the ordinance is up or not. The 11 a.m. is the alcohol start. Yeah, so those tables are going to be there 24-7 is my understanding. At okay. This point. So if someone comes down for coffee at, at 9 a.m. and wants to sit out and have coffee, they can do that. Uh, we'd have to figure out if we're doing sanitizing of those tables or what that would look like at this point. I don't know that answer, but, but Tom is right. The alcohol is the issue that, and at 10 o'clock, it's it's the alcohol that closes. It's not the necessarily the tables, but so, thank you, George. Go ahead, Lindsay. So, from a public health standpoint, um, I think it's incredibly important that we look at continuing this when we have our student population here. Um, I realize the alcohol, and maybe the alcohol component changes once the students get here. That maybe there is an alcohol allowed outside, but because we are going to see our population more than double. I think it is incredibly important that we have outdoor seating options for people to utilize our restaurants and our coffee shops. So I also hope that if we, when we pass this, I hope it gets passed, I'm pretty sure it will, that we aren't putting like closed signs on the tables and things like that before 11 a.m. because we do have a lot of coffee shops and they've been hit very hard and they don't probably have the margins that we would see from a bar or something else. So I, I think we really need to embrace them and find ways to really support them. And I think this is a great tool for that. So I hope it's utilized in that way. Thank you. Uh, some good points. Are there any other comments about the plan, the resolution? Uh, go ahead, Luke. You're muted, Luke. Thank you. Sorry, I can't believe I did that. Um, 
<laughs> uh, just, I was a little, I think I might've missed it, Peter. I think you might've asked it, but, but when would, when would phase two begin? Tom? As, as soon as possible. So we, we still have some research to do to figure out how we can, you know, most simply um, create an approval process for each individual SUP. The intent is to try to, uh, you know, queue up a blanket action that could occur um, and look for, um, you know, economies of scale purchasing around um, the type of fencing and that sort of thing. So we're investigating that right now. And as soon as we can, we'll, we'll, we'll queue it up for discussion and consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Um, go ahead, Michael. So, sorry, um, Lindsay, just to be clear, so phase two doesn't necessarily have to do with the open air dining areas. It has more to do with uh, all, all the different restaurants being able to expand their patios, for example, out onto sidewalks and, and that sort of thing. Correct. And, and taking advantage okay. of the, the new MLCC special rule. Okay. So, because as I'm reading this um, current ordinance, it does include, you know, Valley Court as being designated a, an open air dining area. Um, does that mean once this passes, it's okay for patrons to go out into Valley Court and openly intox, so to speak? No, no. So the distinction there is um, it's not Valley Court Park. Uh, there'll be an oh, area the, par the, the parking road, area of the right, roadway. Right, right. And not until it is cordoned off um, would it be a, okay. would it be considered an open air dining area. So we're starting with Albert um, working out the kinks, and then I think quickly trying to move to Bailey Lot 11 and and the area um, just just uh, south of Valley Court along the roadway there that we would also okay. create these areas. Okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, Lindsay. So I'm also kind of confused about these phases. There, there are two. The second phase has to do with the Michigan liquor control, but then there is also a second phase structurally of the different locations, or is that all considered, are we not having phases for that? Cause that wasn't in our packet. So I'm just, sorry, I'm just a little confused about like the actual timing and the different components of this because we sure. have the parts. Sure. So I call it phase one, phase two, really they're two separate projects, right? One, yeah. one is the outdoor open air dining, um, which um, Albert Street is where we're, we're starting. That plan is in front of you right now. Um, the ordinance, though, uh, also includes the Bailey Lot 11 and Valley Court areas as potential also open air dining areas. So we're starting with Albert and working out the kinks and then moving quickly to Bailey Lot 11 and, and the area along Valley Court. That's for the open air dining concept, which is really more uh, geared towards people um, going into restaurants, um, making purchases to go. If the restaurants have the SDM license, which many, uh, many do, they could also purchase um, um, contained alcohol, closed containers, and be able to bring those into these open air dining areas uh, and partake. Uh, the second project really involves the expansion of outdoor dining for individual restaurants. And again, we're looking at trying to find the, the quickest road um, and some sort of a blanket approval that the council could potentially take to allow, uh, allow folks to take advantage of, of the MLCC's uh, rules that have been uh, created on a special basis um, and, and expand outdoor dining um, at their individual ex establishments taking advantage of the public right of way. Okay. I have a question. Um, you, you touched on it, but I don't know if I still have a clear understanding of why we may not be able to utilize the parks. So why wouldn't we be able to put tables in Bill Sharp Park or Valley Court Park to be used by uh, as an overflow for restaurants? I, I, do, I don't know what steps need to be required to allow that or why that isn't part of our uh, resolution or overview that we would be making recommendations to the council. So I might, I might ask Tom Yaden to, to um, step in on that. I think it's just a different, um, different animal in terms of um, the types of uh, approvals that would be necessary. It's not necessarily off the table, but it's not part of this particular yeah. Um, this Can I just jump in quick? Because there's also there's also an operational issue here, and that is um, 
putting park tables on grass areas and having them wear out and get maintenance very quickly, you know, it's going to look deteriorated and terrible. If you have asphalt, like on Ann Street, you can do that. It's going to look fine. If you put things in the street, it's okay. But if you have this sort of high traffic areas and tables on grass areas, it may not look good for very long at all and uh, becomes a big maintenance issue. So I think we're starting a little bit more conservatively with less maintenance. And then if it's, you know, if there's a need, perhaps we can expand it. Uh, go ahead, Lindsay. Okay, so going, circling back a little bit to this phase one and phase two, you mentioned that the phase two would, has to do with allowing people to use the public right away to expand their, um, their eating area. I'd still, I think it's very important that we still uh, um, either council or we look into how we allow people to expand into their own parking lots so they don't violate their special use permits. So speaking that we would, and when I talk about that, I'm thinking of places like Trowbridge and Brookfield and areas where there are private spaces that are designated in their site plans and their special use permits and with the zoning requirements where they have to have a certain amount of parking or, you know, it, it's contingent on those components. I think we need to make it so that they have the flexibility and that has to be something that has to be done with the city. So I would like to see those changes. I don't know if that's a phase three. I think we should find out something and that should be able to be voted on at the next um, city council meeting. But I, it just concerns me that we've kind of neglected that area. <laughs> okay, uh, staff, do you want to follow up any comments on Lindsay's questions? Um, no, I mean, I, I think that's certainly part of our calculus in terms of, you know, allowing the expansion and, and the actions that would be necessary um, to approve that. I think, you know, uh, some kind of a temporary relaxed standards in terms of the parking, uh, if it's available on site. We've also heard from Mr. Kruger and other others regarding the kind of occupancy limit um, and, and questions uh, regarding, you know, how the outdoor seating um, and building occupancy permit levels um, will jive kind of with the, the um, any of the distancing requirements that we're expecting. So that's all, that's all part of our, our analysis and research and, and, you know, will be part of what we present um, when, when that's, when, when we're ready. Uh, just a quick question uh, as a follow-up. So what, presumably the DDA is going to make a recommendation for a plan that can be phased in over time the council will take action on this at their next meeting. Is there going to be any subsequent action the DDA needs to take following the council's action this, their upcoming meeting? Yes, I think that's very likely. So the action you're taking today is potentially really just speaks to this open air dining question. It's a discrete uh, ordinance and will allow for the open air dining to be implemented in the three areas that are spelled out in the ordinance. Um, also today, I think it's prudent for the DDA to consider, um, you know, whether whether you have interest in funding uh, any of the elements that uh, that we've identified as as needing funding. Um, so certainly, uh, cleanliness is probably the big big factor. I know that um, Heather and Chad have been doing research in terms of getting quotes for. Um, you know, uh, custodial folks to, to come and, and, and sanitize the tables in, in a manner that will be appropriate. There's also things to consider, um, such as uh, sanitizing stations, signage, other, otherwise, um, as part of this open air dining concept. And so I think it's important that the DDA, um, you know, uh, really understand if, if they have an interest in terms of any funding and at what potential levels based on the information that we currently have, which I'm sure Heather uh, would be happy to share with you. But that would be the action today. And then I think, you know, as, as our research unfolds in terms of how we can best make possible the, the outdoor dining expansion of individual restaurants, there will likely be other ordinance changes and policies that need to be discussed. We would want uh, the DDA to, to really opine on that and, and create a recommendation for council in short order. Um, and so, um, you know, our, our hope is that we'll have something 
put together for your next meeting, which I think is um, in a couple of weeks. Um, and we're, we're working diligently um, to try to try to get that ready for you. Thank you. Uh, you know, I think there's been a lot of really great ideas that have been expressed that hopefully staff can take back and, and articulate to the council when they take their action. But in my view, I'd like to see as many tables in, a, in as many areas as expeditiously as possible available to try and allow for the lost revenue that a lot of these downtown restaurants are experiencing presently. So I, I think there's a general consensus on that. I just don't know how to move that forward expeditiously. Uh, and um, if there's anyone else that would like to comment, uh, Lindsay, go ahead. Yeah, I expeditiously, I think it is the perfect word here um, because I, I'm still concerned that we could easily have changed these special use permits. To me, that's like a first step because then it leaves businesses able to do what they want on their own property. So I really hope to see some kind of ordinance drafted and ready for us to adopt at our next meeting, because I, I want to let businesses do what they see fit for their property, um, but also taking into account public health. Um, the second thing is, I did I miss something or do you already have a list of um, items in the cost? Because we're talking about wanting to approve that. I think all of us are in total totally in support of designating some of our money to go for this, but I didn't see anything in the packet and I think it's difficult for us to, you know, we keep saying we would support it, but I, I'd like to see some actual numbers. Heather, I, do you have some preliminary estimates? Yep. So um, we um, Chad did some research and came up with, some, first of all, the question is cleaning companies. So if you have, we're going to need someone on site um, for the entire time, whether it's one person, or, you know, half a day and another person comes in. Um, but for just to give you an idea of the range, it's $215 a day up to $660 a day to have someone down there uh, staffing it, wiping down the tables when people leave, clean up. So if you're looking at like just even a 12 week period just along Albert Avenue, you're looking anywhere from $20,000 up to $55,000 just for cleaning sanitation of those tables in that area. Um, the other thing that was brought up was um, putting up um, hand, sign, hand sanitizing stations um, throughout the downtown. Um, that's been a little bit more difficult because so many places, everything's out of stock. Um, but we were able to um, find the same type of um, product that the farmer's market's going to be using. And Public Works, um, I've talked to them about just, a, we're thinking we'll just attach these dispensers to light posts and different things like that. Um, those cost $22 a piece. Um, those and then um, the fire department has an arrangement where there's a distillery that's actually making hand sanitizer and bulk and that we're using it throughout different facilities. So we're thinking we would be able to work with them to get that hand sanitizer. So, you know, if you're looking at just Albert Avenue, um, minimum, and there may be something that we're, we're not even thinking of at this point, this doesn't include signage, which Signage shouldn't be too expensive, maybe another thousand dollars in this area. Um, but just for the cleaning, you know, probably around twenty-five thousand dollars just for a twelve-week period to have someone out there sanitizing the tables and cleaning them. Um, which brings up the next question is, is that something that we wanna the the DDA wants to take on and do that? Or are we thinking that if someone comes down and they want to use that space when they're, you know, when they're done? It's up to you know, sit at your own risk and wipe it down with your own items that you bring with you. So, so that's here for your discussion. Um, we can do some more research on some other items, um, but again, um, we received I think it was five different quotes, and again, those range. Yeah, there was five of them. You know, again, two hundred fifteen dollars a day up to six hundred sixty dollars a day just to, for the cleaning of those tables and that. So. So that's that's six hundred and the the maximum was six hundred and sixty dollars a day to clean sixteen tables. Yes, and and the sanitizing product. Okay. Provide all the product to do the sanitizing. Each one of these groups would. That that uh, with all public health considerations in mind, that doesn't seem to be the most economical approach for us to take. It would, 
what are other communities doing in their downtowns? Are there this hand sanitizing stations? And and to me, that's the way to go. But I'm I'm open for other ideas. Um, what I've heard other communities are doing is that it's you sit at your own risk kind of thing. Like there's you know public. If you think about it, there's public benches. We you know there's different things that people when they walk through our downtown they're going to sit on a bench. They're going to sit on a, one of our um, brick you know walls along Ann Street Plaza. So, you know, where do you stop? Do you, do you only clean those tables, but someone could walk out and sit on the brick wall outside the Ann Street Plaza and eat their dinner there? So do you have them sanitize that? So, you know, this was just for the picnic tables. Um, and so that's why I think it's, you know, I don't know, maybe Tom Yang could weigh in on this, but, you know, are we taking on a risk by providing the service too? You know, we provide the service, the table gets clean, but maybe something happens and, and you know, there is something left on it, you know, so. Um, I noticed Jill wishes to make a comment and then maybe Tom can fill in uh, some of those answers for us. Go ahead, Jill. A question for George. I mean, couldn't we just hire a handful of temps to do this like you would at a park? Yeah, I think it's, I mean, I think our idea is that it's better to hire a contractual firm. I would be uh, asked the question, there's a range, a huge range. You said 215 to 600? Yes. So I like the $200 number. Right. Um, can you tell me what's the difference and, and why wouldn't we just go with a lower number custodial and hire that person? I expected we'd be spending 20 grand or some number for six weeks or eight weeks of sanitizing. So that number doesn't shock me for yep. that many hours of coverage, but. Right. So um, lowest one is $25 an hour um, is how it worked, um, $25 per an hour, and they supply the disinfectant, um, let me see, I'm sorry, $18 an hour, and they supply the disinfectant. So, um, and it, it was just a range. We want to get an idea and get as many quotes as possible um, just for comparison purposes, so. I think if we're providing the amenity, we should, uh, first off, I'd like to add more than 16 tables and hopefully we can get to 20 or 25 tables, but adding at $18 an hour, a custodial person down there where that person is there during from 11 a.m. to 10 p.m., we pay them from the DDA. And if it's, like I said, 20 grand or 25 grand, I think that's the cost of having this amenity available for people. We want it to be as sanitary as we can make it. So I would support that. Thank you. Uh, Michael has a comment. Yeah, I'm just wondering if we're taking into account um, more trash cans, um, people being there to pick up the trash that people will inevitably leave behind um, and emptying the trashes throughout the day. And, all, you know, I don't know if that's included in the quote to sanitize or not, but I feel like that could potentially become an issue with uh, large styrofoam takeout boxes filling up trash bins rather quickly um, and I don't you know as much as I respect the residents of East Lansing I don't think that necessarily 100% of them are always going to put the stuff where it's supposed to be so that may be public works employees Tom or Heather did you look at that in terms of we already pay for public works support for the downtown emptying barrels right so we would have them place that barrels out like they place during um, foot home football games and those types of things but again these hours are much later. They're outside the normal, about, you know, the times that we have public works employees down here. So we would have to confirm with the cleaning company if they would, you know, take on that responsibility. Also, at, in the evening at 11, you know, when they're cleaning up at 10 p.m. and there's trash, you know, do we just have them take it to one of our trash rooms at that point? Um, is there extra cost for them to be doing that? We would just have to confirm that with them. Thank you. Um, additional comments? Any other ideas? Oh, go ahead, Luke. Um, yeah, I, I completely understand where um, George is coming from in terms of picnic tables and the, the parks, but it just seems like it's a it's such a missed opportunity to not utilize them at all and that there's just so much space involved. Is there any way we could allow for people just to like sit down on a park floor where you normally would like bring a bring a bring a picnic blanket and still be able to order something from one of these restaurants or bars. Well, I, there's I, nothing that, stopping you from doing that. You can do that yeah. because it's all takeout. 
but you couldn't enjoy alcohol in that area. You would just get your food and go sit on a blanket, sit on a picnic table, do whatever you want to do. But the alcohol would only be in this area. Right, Tom? Well, my question is why, I guess. Tom Yaden. Tom, is he still there? He has me. Oh, there he is. Yeah. George? Yep, I hear you. Yeah, the uh, um, there need need to be some significant changes to the ordinance if we were going to do parks. So um, currently, alcohol is only allowed in uh, Patchy Arch Park under limited circumstances. So if if you're going to expand the consumption of alcohol into the parks. Uh, the questions are, do you want to just allow it in parks during certain times? And, and that's a relatively easy ordinance. If you just allowed it in all parks from 10 to, uh, from 11 a.m. to 10 p.m. or whenever the parks close. Um, but uh, it would need some changes to the current ordinance. You couldn't do it under the current, current ordinances. And part of the thought about starting this and the talk about policing and, and sanitizing was we wanted a place that was somewhat condensed that they could police and keep an eye on. And if we spread out and make it too large, we're absor absorbing more risk, more cost, more things that we can't keep an eye on. So I'm comfortable recommending what we've recommended. If it goes much beyond that, you know, I have to look more carefully at it. So we wanted something that we could implement quickly and do it. And I think that's what we have here. It just seems like we're doing a lot of work for a couple of tables. Well, if you have 20 tables or if you can get to 25 tables, four to six people per table, it's 100, 150 people, 120 people in the downtown continuously. There's zero right now. Right. Yeah. Plus they have the capacity of their own restaurant, their own dining capacity. This is supplementing that, right? Provided they're ever allowed to or if, you know. Um, if they're not allowed to, we won't be allowed to either. So if, if you can't be at 30% or 50% restaurant capacity, we're not doing, we're not gonna be operating this either. So if we're not allowed to. So you gotta see this as kind of supplementing what's already gonna be there. And then if the, if the restaurants are 25%, they could have another you know, 20 people who've ordered food sitting outside to help them make it more viable, so. Thank you. Uh, Lindsay, did you have another comment? So I am not going to support the, I do not personally support the extra cost of having someone clean it. I think it's completely reasonable that when people come down that you are, if you want it to be cleaned, to be sanitized, that you're going to have to sanitize it. I know that personally, when I've gone to parks in the past, that's what I've done when I've had, you know, I have little kids. And so, you know, that you're going to go to a park and the table might be dirty and you wipe it down. I don't think that's an unreasonable expectation at this point in time. I do agree with Luke and anyone else who said that we should allow this in our parks. And I think that if you, especially if you tied it in, like, you know, alcohol is permitted when you have takeout food, then you, then it's very, very clear that like, Hey, if you, you know, you're allowed to have some beer, if you're going to go get your Qdoba, or if you're going to go get crunchies, you're allowed to have your beer with it. I think there's a way to tie it in that you have to have takeout food with you. That makes it way easier for police to enforce, but also encourages people in a public health emergency to utilize our public open spaces for public health. So from that standpoint and supporting our businesses, I think it's a perfect combination. And it kind of concerns me that we're wanting to just eliminate it altogether when we have these great spaces. Yeah. Hey, I just, we've talked about this all afternoon here. Let's just get to a vote then. I mean, my view is staff is proposing what we can propose and what we can do and what's doable. And, I, and I'm not comfortable recommending this to council without sanitizing the tables at this point to provide an area that we don't think is safe or as safe as can be, let's say that, safe as can be, because I think nothing's gonna be 100% safe until there's a vaccine and we're done with this. But I think sanitizing is an important portion of this. So if the DDA is not willing to do that, let's just figure that out and, and see if you're willing to spend the $25,000 at this point. Um, I think it's a reasonable cost to show people that we're doing things to keep them safe. So that's my view. So if you wanna- Excuse me, stuff. excuse me, Greg Balline. <laughs> 
uh, hey, if I could. Go ahead. Go ahead, Greg. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Um, if I could just, I think there's kind of a, a, a nice compromise here that may be available to us if, if each table had cleaning products available for self-use. Uh, I think we could save ourselves a lot of money, uh, you know, by putting disinfectant spray and paper towels available on every table. I think we'd save ourselves a lot of money. Uh, and I think we'd still provide a safe environment for people who are more than welcome to use those products on their table. And most of them will. Um, how we go about staffing it, supplying it, I, I couldn't begin to do it. But uh, I, I agree with Lindsay and I agree with George. I agree with both of you. We need to provide a safe environment. But I don't know that we need to have a $25,000 expense with it. You know, if we were to spend $5,000 on cleaning supplies for it and make it self-use, I think that everybody would chip in and gladly clean their own tables before they sat down. That's just my opinion. Well, uh, I, I tend to agree with your comments, Greg. I, I think it's really cost prohibitive to think that we're going to have, um, you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of about a $40,000 expenditure just to wipe tables down. I I don't know if that is our our intent or our responsibility. And I don't really know with these different sanitation, hand sanitation uh, stations or uh, sanitation supplies that could be part and parcel to each table. How, what would that look like? Or can we get some idea of what that might cost? Yeah, staff can look into that. So this is Jeff. Uh, this is Jeff. I would, if I may. Yeah, go ahead, Jeff. Um, you know, the more we discover about the virus, the less we discover about the virus. I don't think that any of us know how to keep this stuff as safe as possible. I think if people are sitting at that table and they bring their own sanitation to clean up the table, clean up where they're sitting down, it very well could be that the next person sitting down catches it just because they didn't clean up underneath of the, um, you know, the bottom of the, the tabletop enough. If the sanitation crew comes through and they clean up as best they can, but they didn't clean up, you know, just this one crack enough and they catch it, it's going to be impossible to keep it where it needs to be. I, I would say this is a, we put a sign on it that says, you know, provided by the city of East Lansing for use at your own risk. Uh, please, you know, maintain social distancing and sanitation um, standards as best you can. I don't, I don't see how we're going to stay on top of it enough to keep it as clean as it needs to be. So this is my thing. As we go to restaurants right now and you're going for takeout, every place is saying we're sanitizing regularly because they're trying to give people an assurance Meyer has people wiping stuff down all the time. They're wiping handles down, they're wiping stuff down to make people feel comfortable coming back into that environment that we're doing all we can to keep it clean. And now we're saying we're gonna have this big initiative to get people to be comfortable coming out into the daylight and using these restaurants. And we're not gonna spend the $20,000 to help sanitize, to keep it safe and make people comfortable and feel safe. I think it's a missed opportunity. So I, just I'm, make people and, comfortable and safe. That's what I'm saying. And, uh, yeah, don't do it if you, if you don't want to do it. They don't want to spend the money. I'll see if maybe perhaps the city wants to spend the money. But I, I don't, you know, our, our coffers are not limitless in supporting the downtown. We have a million dollar budget. This is not a big amount of money to try to get people into the downtown and get them comfortable coming down there to eat and start using these restaurants. I, and, and I don't, I don't disagree with that at all, George. I, and I completely agree with where you're coming from. It's just, you know, at two o'clock or three o'clock in the morning, you might have somebody come through and douse the whole thing with something that we can't control. We can't, there's when, when it's indoors and it's Meyer and it's beggars banquets indoors, they can lock the doors. They can, they can ultimately somewhat control the space that they're in. Once it's in the public realm, it's very, very difficult, as you know, to keep that stuff controlled. But why wouldn't you want a custodian to come through at 11 in the morning and sanitize everything before people sit down to start eating? So there you have it. 
I, I, if people don't want to spend the money, like I said, we'll put warning signs and say, use at your own risk. And then we're not encouraging families to come use it, I don't think, because we're, we're giving all sorts of caveats and telling them what we're not going to do. So I like trying to keep people safe, but. Okay, uh, I, healthy, healthy conversation. Go ahead, Lindsay. I just do have one question. I am, I think that we should be allocating money in the morning and in the evening, either to have DPW, you know, doing trash. At the, we, we're gonna have to have someone to do trash at that late hour. I think that we do need some kind of like baseline at the beginning and end of the day. That's fine. I think hiring someone to be sitting out there all day is a, is really a waste of money for the, for something that we cannot control. And it's outside. It's not like you are in Meyer where Meyer doesn't even require face mask. So honestly, if they want to act like, I mean, that's so, the number one way to stop this. So George, uh, from your perspective, would it make sense for the DDA to recommend uh, expenditures up to a certain amount? And I presume there would be other areas of the city's budget, like the, the public works that might be attending to some of the needs that we would have in the downtown? Uh, you know, we just have to talk to council and say our recommendation was that we have sanitizing and the DDA recommended against it. And we'll have to see what council wants to do with that. Well, let, I don't know if we're necessarily not recommending expenditures from the DDA budget. The, I think the question is, what's the appropriate path to take? And at the present moment, I don't know if we know exactly what the costs are because we have five different quotes. So, and that may not even necessarily be needed at the present time to move this forward. But if the DDA is pledged to commit some resources with further ex, uh, you know, exploring by staff, then why wouldn't we just move forward today and see what those costs are? Or do we have to do it all at once? No, I don't think we do. Tom, what's your thought on that? Uh, no, I mean, I think you could you could take several approaches. You do have another meeting on June 11th where we could, um, you know, uh, hone in on some numbers uh, for you and do some additional legwork. I think it would be good to um, to telegraph if you if you do intend to support and perhaps at, at sort of what ballpark level. Um, that might be um, important for the council to know on June 9th as part of their deliberations. Okay. Um, Michael, did you have a follow-up comment? Yeah, no, I was just um, asking what we're actually being asked to vote on right here. And I didn't understand that it had anything to do with any kind of cost of anything. It was more to whether or not to recommend this ordinance go forward to city council. Is that correct? Yes, uh, I think that's the main the main uh, hope of staff is to have you know your your feedback uh, and and uh, potentially uh, um, and a recommendation to council regarding the ordinance itself. Uh, but also, um, you know, it it would be uh, productive, I think, for the DDA to uh, to opine on whether they intend to support some of the uh, resources necessary and some of the cost items. Okay. But we and can't really do that until we actually have an actual number, correct? We could do it. Yeah. Unless we were, unless we were to like say up to a certain amount or whatever the case may be. Okay. Yeah, Joe, you, could, you could do many things. You could do You could give a general idea of what level of support. You could take a specific motion to rec to approve an expenditures up to a certain amount, uh, or you could direct staff to come back for quotes on specific uh, items that you wish to fund and, and bring those back for your consideration on June 11th. Those would be three options and I'm sure there's others as well. Okay. Go ahead, Joe. I'm just gonna throw this proposal out to get a proposal out. I propose that we approve the ordinance and authorize up to $20,000 to be spent on this project with any supplement um, being appropriated by the city. I'll second that. It's been moved by Jill, supported by George, to advance the plan as presented with the expenditure up to $20,000 uh, for sanitation efforts. Uh, do you wanna to speak to your motion, Jill? And if and we've talked about quite a few different ideas no, here. That's about $300, that's about $300 a day, which seems appropriate. 
um, if the city wants to do enhanced over that, then they can put in a couple, you know, another 20,000 or whatever they think they need to do. And again, it was just a proposal to get the thing moving. Sure. Okay. Um, anyway, go ahead, uh, Lindsay. You're muted, Lindsay. I will be supporting the motion, um, but I would really like staff to explore uh, Mr. Balline's concept of having the tables, even if someone were to steal them occasionally, I know that's gonna be like the number one biggest concern. I think that um, leaving that for the, the patrons to do and then considering utilization of DPW staff for some of the trash needs, I think is probably a pretty fiscally responsible way to have a good balance for this. So I would like that, that's personally what I, I hope that staff explores versus having a manned person down there all the time. I just don't see how that's a good utilization of, D, of DDA money. Any other comments? Uh, yes, so, yes, Peter, Greg go ahead. Yeah, Greg. If, if I could just expand on it just a little bit, I, you know, I think it's also an opportunity for people to um, step up and possibly create sponsorship opportunities for supplying the products. We have businesses in town and apparently places, distilleries that are creating hand sanitizer, things like that. And, you know, maybe an opportunity to sponsor those products for us uh, might save us a lot of money. Uh, and I think we should explore those opportunities before we commit a lot of money to it. That's my thoughts. Yeah, I think those are great recommendations, uh, Greg, and certainly we should be uh, looking at ways in which we can provide sponsorship opportunities. Uh, I, I'm supportive of the plan as presented, but I think there's a lot of other areas that we've talked about that really need to be further expanded upon. And I, whether or not it comes in additional phases, um, I'd like to see every utilization of available space to be uh, available for businesses. And, um, and to the degree that it's available in the public parks, I, I would like to have that included as well. But I recognize that there are further discussions that need to be held at the council level to address that. So uh, are there, is there anyone else that wishes to comment on what's been moved and supported and that's presently in front of us? Uh, seeing none, then we can we take a roll call vote on this? And the motion is to approve the plan as presented by staff for Albert Avenue with up to twenty thousand um, dollars of sanitation expenses. Sure, thank you, Chair. Ball line. Yes. Mayor Byer. Yes. Clayton? Yes. Duan? Yes. Hackney? Yes. Could you repeat Hackney, please? Yes. Thank you. Kruger? Yes. Lahanas? Yes. Rody? Yes. Smith? Yes. Passes unanimously. Thank you. Um, thanks for the uh, convert, uh, conversation and a lot of really great ideas. Uh, we're going to move on to committee reports. Are there, Heather, any committee reports? No. No, okay. Uh, so we will, nothing from Parking Task Force or anything from the Downtown Management Board? No, okay. Are there any board members who no. wish to offer any comments? Um, yeah, just real quick. I, I think we, um, if, we, if we could maybe discuss uh, Lindsay's uh, idea about ice cream trucks, either either at P&I or market development, just, just because it's interesting to me, I think that would be great. That certainly fine to address that at the subcommittee. Is it, um, well, can I, may I just say one thing? Is there anyone else that's other than me that's really interested in seeing this? I mean, I think not not just from a public health standpoint, but also like you know, an ice cream getting being able to get a two dollar ice cream or a one dollar 
you know, popsicle is a lot cheaper for a lot of children and a lot of families right now. And being able to, when kids are at home all day long and their parents are working, being able to have access to something like that seems really important. So am I, I maybe I'm just the only one that feels strongly about this, but I, I don't want to bring it to a, a committee if no one else is interested in this. If, Lindsay, if I may, this is Jeff. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Jeff. You, you said first, go. Um, I helped draft the concessionaires policy. Um, I think George was involved in that as well. Um, the, the, the biggest rub at the time was, you know, they're, they're non-property tax paying entities that are making their way around, uh, you know, DDA for, you know, property tax paying entities. That was, that was the biggest rub, um, at the time. And it, it is still, it will, it will no doubt still be the biggest issue as it's brought to light again. Um, the other side of that is just determining uh, where the, the boundaries are. Is it DDA, is it citywide? I know some neighborhoods have restrictions and covenants in place to keep those things uh, out of the neighborhood. Um, so it, it, it won't be a, a short conversation, there's no doubt. It'll, it'll be a much larger conversation on policy, but I'm, I'm all for it. Any other comments from board members? Yes, Greg Ballin. Go ahead, Greg. Uh, you know, just on a personal note, you know, when my daughter was young, we'd hear the ice cream truck and we'd go running. So on a personal note, I really enjoyed having ice cream in the neighborhoods driving around, hearing the music, running for, trying to figure out where it was coming from. So from a social aspect, I, I really enjoyed that. Uh, watching my child's face light up was really kind of enjoyable. So if we could explore having that in our community again, I, I think we should. That's my belief. Thank you. Any other board member comments? Seeing none, uh, we will adjourn the meeting, a move to adjourn, supported by Luke. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you everyone, the meeting's adjourned. <laughs>